1 Chronicles 12, 32. I want to preface this this morning by saying this message that I have preached this morning, I was telling Sonny today that this may be one of the most important messages that I've preached in probably 30 years. I don't say that lightly. So you that have been here a long time, you know that that means something to me. Today is not the average. Today is not the expected. Today, I believe God is directing me in a whole different way. First Chronicles 12.32 says this, And from the tribe of Issachar there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood the signs of the time and knew the best course for Israel to take. God bless the reading of this word, bless our ears to receive it, and we thank you ahead of time for the fruit that it brings in our individual lives, and everybody said. This is an unusual family, because this is one family in all the tribes and all the families that had this ability to discern the signs of the times. They were able to look what was going on, look at the promises of God, and come up with a good answer to what was going on. I believe it's important for you and I to understand that we live in, as the scripture says, the times of the last days. Amen? The times of the last days. And it, it's important that I know that and that you know that because unless we know where we're at, we won't know how to get to where we need to go, the, the direction we need to go. Very simple. You have a GPS on your phone. You have a GPS in your car, wherever you have it. The first thing I ask you is, where are you? Because it can't direct you to go to where you need to go unless you know where you're at. And too many times, whether it be in our marriages, we don't know where we're at. Whether it would be growing up in our, in, as a young adult, we don't know where we're at. Whether it be in our Christian walk, we don't know where we're at. So we have to stop right there and we say, God, help me to discern the times where I'm at. Now, as a pastor, I deal in spiritual things. So I deal in the realms of the Spirit. I deal in the realms of what the Word of God says. Can somebody say a good amen? It's very important for me to, um, to know the signs of the time. And I come to you this morning with a message that I believe does just exactly that, that gives us direction. Never, ever before since my time as a Christian have I seen before a church more lukewarm and divided than I see in America. We're only privy to people that we're in direct contact with. But we go to Mexico and we hear all these horrendous stories They've actually called off ministers' meetings in Mexico with places that we've been before because there's actual fighting and fist fighting going on with the ministers. I call off meetings. To get one church to come with another and be in unity is, is like pulling eye teeth. I hear and talk to our missionaries where similar things are going on across the globe. And, and we see this even in America, even in Lee Summit where you can hold a prayer meeting and people are more concerned about who you are than who we're praying to. It's not the fact. See, because what we got to understand, brothers and sisters, is whether you're Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Spirit-filled, you know, as long as you are born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're in this thing called the family of God. And there may be differences, and there may be things that we believe strongly and we emphasize more than others, but the bottom line is some, a lot of people are going to be fooled by who makes heaven because we have this own perception of who's going to make it. I want you to know something. It won't just be all Assembly of God folks. It won't just be non-denominational folks. It just won't be spirit filled up. We call baptizing Holy Spirit folks. There will be people in heaven that you won't even imagine, but they only can come one way through Jesus Christ. So we've got to line up our thinking in a way. Somebody says, well, I, it's like in Mexico, I was praying and say, Lord, you know, it's, all, it's come down here now. Talk to people in other countries, it's spread out there now. And once we're, we're, there were revivals 5, 10, 15 years ago, now there is division in these places. And the answer is simple, because these are the last days. We have an outside the walls of the church we have an entire generation listen to me that is not born again the majority of them are not born again 
They are raised without the influence of church in their life. You cannot call a Christer, which is a person that comes at Christmas and Easter, raised with an influence of the church. Now the church, I use these words synonymously, and it's gotten me in trouble in the past. I consider the family of God the church. I consider the church the family of God. I believe that the family of God and the church should make Jesus the priority. Period. Period. Excuse me if that bothers you that I think Jesus should be first. But that's what I signed up for when I became a Christian. So whether it's first as a church or whether, as, as the family of God, we must get back to Bible basics. You know, I like a lot of things that are going on in the new culture today in Christianity, the young people, what they're doing. I, don't, I have a hard time participating. I can't jump as high as I used to. I can't shout as long as I used to. But I still can worship like I used to. I can still praise like I used to. The bottom line is, and I've got a message I'm going to be preaching during this warrior series that we began, it, and it's called, Who is Your Enemy? I believe a lot of people in Christianity don't really even know who their enemies are. They're fighting and just swinging at the air and hoping, just out of frustration and being mad or being confused, just hoping that they hit something. Hey, I get it. You don't like the way things are going on in your family. You don't like the way things are going health-wise. You don't like the way things are going on financially. You don't like the way things are going on with each other. You may not like the way things are going on, you know, here at the church. I'm going to tell you why. Because we get comfortable, and we forget to fight. Please listen to me. When God ordains a change, and he has in this place more frequently late with the couple of men that we love and endear, it's not that he cares if we like that or not. Please understand that. Back in the time of World War I, World War II, there was, a, there was a draft, right? And for the most part, people didn't like to see their sons and daughters go off to war not knowing if they'll come back. They didn't like it. But they understood, they understood there was a greater purpose. When God uses you and I, it's not for us to determine or other people to determine what God has called or what God does with us, anything. The main determination is to follow the Lord in complete obedience with all of our heart. When I was at Sheffield and we had a large ministry, some of you know the story there, and, and we were in a great place with a great pastor. When God called me out here, I did not want to come. But I knew something about God that even not growing up in church, that it doesn't matter what I want, it's what God wanted. How many hear what I'm talking about? There's this thing called getting ourselves out of the way in order for God to really speak. There's this thing of clearing our head of ourselves so that God can fill our heads with himself. Come on, somebody. And we all, all struggle with that. Judges 2.10 said, that after that generation died, another generation grew up and didn't acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he'd done. Here's what the Lord showed me. We are in the third generation away from the Pentecost, the modern-day Pentecost of the 1900s. In the 1900s, Azusa Street and everything began to be poured out, the Wells Revival, all these things around the 1900s. Now, we know that the Bible says it's appointed unto us, according to the Bible, three score and ten years, which is 70 well, that's the amount of life, but most people today agree that a generation is not 70 years, it's 40. Listen to what I'm saying. So the first generation, Pentecost, was from 1900 roughly to 1940. In that time, if you watch and you read history, it bears us out. The Spirit of God, the Pentecostal, the Holy Ghost movement spread throughout this earth. Nothing like it since the original Church of Acts. They were sitting in chair number one, the chair of commitment. Then from 1940 to 1980, there was the second generation. And, the, and what happened in the second generation was a time of compromise in the church. Those that were born now are in the second generation, and they in that second generation, born out of the first generation, were in a time where we saw legalized abortion and prayer taken out of school. 
it slid farther down away from the original commitment that was made and put us in peril and set us up for what we're experiencing today, the third generation. And the third generation, like I said in the chair message, is the one that's completely perplexed, completely confused, and by and large not committed. That's why you can see and ask yourself, you scratch yourself in the head and say, well, I remember my mother or father was like when they were Christians, and I can even remember my grandfather when they were Christians. How it's changed through the years, you're exactly right. Because unless there is a Holy Ghost intervention, unless there's a Holy Ghost intervention, we will naturally, without hesitation, slide from the first, from commitment to compromise to conflict. And today the church is conflicted because now people are teaching a different version of what it means to be saved. If God still is alive, God still really cares. Is there more than one way to heaven? There's such conflict in the body of Christ today. Humanism has entered in. Extreme Calvinism has come back. And there's all type of things going on that's causing this great problem that we see in the body of Christ today. And this adds to the fact that when you don't believe the only way that the Bible teaches, and you believe several other ways, you can never have real unity. Unity comes when you are all, and we are all headed one way, believing the same thing. How many would agree with that? As long as you and I agree that Jesus Christ is Lord, and it's by Him we're saved, we can walk together. Amen? But we can't walk together. We said there's a multitude of ways that people can go to heaven. That there's a lot of doorways to heaven. And that is what is being preached today. So we see three generations. We are in the generation, the third generation, that believes that you can't talk now. Why do I know that? Because now violence is applied to make people silent if they disagree with you. Look at the college campuses. Look at the protests and the marches in our cities. Nobody's talking. What they do, rather than talk and try to, and try to come together and agree, they have violence. They have finger pointing. They're killing people. The inner city has become a killing field, church. What America stands for, what America believes is now under attack like never before. Even the church, many places, is preaching a cheapened grace that that doesn't bear any resemblance to the holiness and doesn't bear any resemblance to the fire of God which God has called us to. As a matter of fact, they ridicule and they laugh at the fact that you point about this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They laugh and point their fingers at this fact that you say miracles are still for today and there is a miracle that you can have through Jesus Christ. They look at you and say, well, if you can't do it, then it won't happen. I want you to know something. Outside the walls of the church, they, there's a bunch of people that do not believe that God really cares. There are a bunch of people out there that, 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 has, that, that has moved in such a way that we believe the success is how much we own, how beautiful the building, and whether or not we have mega crowds. God does not, does not, does not judge success by those standards. He judged success for me and for you by our heart our intimacy, our longing for Him. Not how much we can build ourselves up in pride and name and, and position, but, but rather how empty we can get ourselves so that we're totally dependent on Jesus. Week in and week out, in the majority of churches in America, yes, even in the Assembly of God churches and all other type of churches, people shuffle in and shuffle out, and there's no altar call, there's no laying on of hands, there's no way to be, and we just receive messages that basically are entitlement messages, and self-building messages. We must have the power of God. Please listen to me. We must have the power of God in our lives, in our families, and in our church. Here's what I want to say to you. For years I've been preaching that we're living in the end time. We're, the end times are coming. Bad times are coming. Hard times are coming. A real trial, a real battle's coming. Let me say something to you. Please understand. Please mark this down. I've changed it today. We are in it. We are no longer looking for it. It is here. We are no longer thinking it shall show up. It has arrived. All we need to do is read the newspaper, watch the television, listen to what's going on in people's lives, and we understand we are in a war regardless if we're fighting in it or not, regardless if we participate in it or not. For some reason, the great commission in Matthew that says to go out and reach and disciple people has now become, under the, under the watch of this generation, the great omission of God. We have omitted our castles, 
Our blessings have become more important. We fear losing them more than we do the presence of God. I speak to myself. It's just too easy to get caught up in this world. It's just too easy to let things get you. It's just too easy to allow the influences of this world to influence your decision. By the way, the influences that we have and decisions that we make make us. So we best consider the fact of what is influencing. Is God influencing me or something else? Is the word of God influencing me or somebody else? We must be influenced by God and his word so that we are on the right path. Can somebody say a good amen? Many Christians say we care about the lost and the unchurched, the poor, the forgotten, the wanton and unseen. If that is your desire, if that is what you really mean, then now is the time for war. Now is the time for war. Spiritual war. The reaching of lost souls. Now is the time of the Revelation 14 sickle to the harvest. The harvest are those lost, unwanted, unseen that are living outside the walls of the church. Listen to me. Outside the walls of the church that nobody's going after, nobody's reaching into, nobody wants to get a little dirty by, nobody wants to get sweaty doing the work. I'm telling you that, that God's getting ready to turn his church. He's speaking directly to his bride that now is the time of the sickle. Now is the time to reach out into a dark world, a hurting world, and show them the hope and love of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say a good amen? We are now living in the days that we saw coming. That's what the Lord had me to say. He also wants me to say this this morning. Out there, not us that have been in Sunday school or Bible school or theology school or all we listen to is Christian music or all we read is... And those are all good things. Please don't understand, misunderstand me. Those are all good things. Out there where the lost are, the hurting, the deprived, the unwanted, they feel unwanted, the lost souls, those that are captured and held by addictions and bondages and demonic spirits, they don't care how much Bible knowledge any church anywhere has. They don't care about how much Bible knowledge we as individuals as Christians have. They are not interested in how many verses you know, and they're not interested whether you have a degree or not in the Bible. You know what they're interested in? They're interested in whether or not we will live what we say we have and whether we practice what we say we profess. They're sick and tired of seeing the church shuffle in and shuffle out and just wave their hand at them. It's time to get busy. It's time to stop being distracted. It's time to settle within yourselves who Jesus really is and what you really are called to do, which is to go and reach and disciple people. Look around your families and friends. Look at them. Just by the showing of hands, how many here, there's problems in your family? How many here have lost people in your family? How many of them are children? How many know marriages in your family and those you know are going through a hard time? How many are being attacked on their finances? How many are going to being attacked with their health? How many have depression and all types of things? How many are addicted to drugs? How many are hands, 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 hands? Can I tell you something? Brother and sister of the cross? This is not the time to throw them a candy heart with a scripture on it. is not the time. That's Valentine's Day. That's not today. That's not the other 364 days of the year. The answer is not throwing somebody a candy heart with sweetness with a scripture on it, walking by and thinking that we've done something great. Here's the answer. Go out into the highways and byways, through the hedges. Compel them to come in that my house be full. Be a conduit of the Holy Spirit so that he can use every one of us the way that he wants to use us because we are in a battle regardless if we think we are or not. For all of you that just raised your hands a minute ago, I want to let you know the result of us having to raise our hands is because Satan is busy. 
Say that with me. Satan is busy. Satan's busy. He sees the time of the coming of the Lord, though he don't know the hour. He sees it coming. It's very short. And every revival, every awakening in the history of religion that dealt with Christianity always came at the time when it looked darkest for the church, when it looked darkest for the people of God. It was never at a high point. It was never. At a, it was at a spiritual low. It was at a, a time of struggle. It was at a time of hurt. Satan is unleashing all of his tactics from hell upon you and your family, and you know that. But the bottom line is, what shall we do about that? I say we because we don't have to work this alone. There's a family of God. There's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that should be battling together. Like never before, there's a stronghold of people when they hear a message or they feel the prompt of the Spirit. It's like they've been chained to their seats. They will not respond to God's grace and mercy. It's almost as if the chains are chains of pride. I've never seen Christian marriages. I understand secular marriages being destroyed by divorce, but I have never seen Christian marriages destroyed by divorce like ever before. It is something that's horrible. It's dividing and tearing up families. When two people come together and are married in the faith, listen, brother, sister, that's exactly what it should be, married in the faith, and that means God's at the center of your family, and God wants to be there, and God wants to help, and God can heal, God can destroy the enemy that tries to put you asunder. We give up too easy. Never seen so many people all my life that are addicted to pornography and adultery and drugs and alcohol and all these things. It ravages not just in the non-Christian home, but many, many Christians' homes. I hear about your stories. I hear about what's going on. We think the bottom just fell out, and that's the way they were. I want to tell you something. Satan works on us a lot longer than we realize before the bottom falls out. I've never seen a time in 30-some years I've been pastoring, 40 years I've been in ministry, where kids have turned on their parents and parents have turned on their kids. I've never seen a time when parents are selling their kids into prostitution and drugs and sexual exploits. But it's happening now. Mothers taking their little girls, 6, 8, 9, 10 years old, to truck stops to have sex with men. Mothers, what is the matter? What's going on? Parents allowing their daughters to jump in cars, half-dressed, thinking that it's okay, and wondering why, why guys got their hands all over them. It's because we have denied the Word of God, and what we say must line up with what we do. The world is not afraid of us because there's nothing to be afraid of. Without the power of God, the world doesn't have to fear us at all. He sees that Satan sees the time is to strike the family when there's less prayer, less power, less consecration, less commitment. He, when he sees a powerless, prayerless Christian or a powerless, prayerless, apathetic home towards Christianity, then he says, now is the time to strike that home. Now is the time to strike that person. Now is the time to strike that church. And what we're seeing at large, now's the time to strike that nation. Our families, our individual lives is a microcosm of the family. Our families are a microcosm of the church. The church is a microcosm of what you're seeing all over. A great evangelist once said that the problems that we have in Congress, the political problems we have, can be laid at the foot of the pulpits in America, Period. It's because of what they have not said. Not because of what they said. It's because of what they have not said. Not because of what they've said. It's because of what they are not doing. The halls of Congress are riddled with compromise and sin. That was over a hundred years ago. And it's still true today. No one. No one. Is going to be spared. From the battles that we face and are in right now. Because Satan is not afraid of anybody. He's mad and he sees his ability to strike. He's mad. Joshua 2 
9 through 11. Let me paraphrase that if you want to put it up. Joshua 2, 9 through 11. Please look at that later. It says this. I, the Lord, have given you the land. I know the Lord has given you the land. This is uh, uh, Rahab speaking to Joshua, Joshua's men. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. We have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea. We know what you did to the two Amorite kings whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. And look what Rahab said to him, said to these spies. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. You know what we get out of this? Joshua passes over. Moses dies, says, now you're in charge. He takes the people over with God's help. They get to the wall, the fortified city, the strong army of Jericho. This is such a huge city. The walls are so wide, chariots can even have races on top of it. They have an outstanding army, and they look over the wall and see this ragtag. It should have been looking over the wall and see some ragtag army they laugh at. But what was going on? Why didn't they open the gates? Why didn't they run out there and destroy them off the face of the earth compared to what they had? They were melted in their hearts with fear. They were absolutely fearful because God was with them and not with the people of Jericho. Why didn't they start shooting arrows when they marched around the wall six times and then seven times the last day and shouted? Because they were absolutely paralyzed by the fear of God because they heard the miracles God did through them. They heard the things that God said through them. They heard of all the things that God had done for them and they said, we can't even begin to fight these people. So the fear went to the enemy rather than the enemy bringing the fear to God's people. That's why they didn't rush out the wall and destroy the armies of God when they were marching around just playing a trumpet. Today, the enemy isn't fearful of God's people. Today, he doesn't care because he doesn't see of the, of the, of the rivers being dried up to walk through. He doesn't hear of the strongholds they made being completely destroyed and the demons running for their lives. He doesn't hear any of those things anymore, church. And so what he's saying is, I'm not afraid of you. I'm going to destroy you. So he's literally coming outside the walls of his fortified city and attacking Christians. And Christians are either denying there's even a fight and seeing themselves die, or they don't know how to fight or give up too easy and surrender. I'm here to call you. I'm here to call people everywhere, those watching and everywhere else, to war. I'm here to tell you, we cannot be satisfied watching what's happening to our sons and daughters and marriages. We cannot be satisfied with our bodies riddled with disease and disgust. I said disgust because you're disgusted. You're mad. But we're mad at the wrong person. We shouldn't be mad at God. We shouldn't be mad at ourselves. We should be mad at the devil. We shouldn't be worried about our brothers and sisters. Your, your fight is not with your brothers and sisters. Your fight is with the devil, who is principality and powers, wickedness in high places. The devil. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying today? Satan sees nothing to fear. He slaps you, and we cry. He kicks you, and we whine and call somebody to pray for us. Is that wrong? No. Only if you haven't prayed for yourself first. It's too easy to call a prayer line, and let's not bombard heaven with our own prayers. It, it's too easy to let somebody else pray for us, go for us, speak for us, preach for us, teach when, when God has called us to do that. It's quiet. Instead of shouting from the rooftops and sounding an alarm from the pulpits of churches and from evangelists and from prophets and people everywhere, what we're hearing is false teaching and false prophecies. Over the last three weeks, I've heard prophecies, I've read prophecies, and it go like this. God is with you, all is safe. God wants to bless you. God wants to prosper you. 
Give me $500 and God will make you happy and comfortable. No wonder the outside world is laughing at the church. If it wasn't so sad, we could laugh ourselves. My blessing and my prosperity doesn't depend on if I can give God $1,000. It doesn't depend on personalities. It doesn't depend on large mentalists. It depends on the grace and the mercy and the love of God, which he is full of. The Bible says his mercy is new every morning. I don't have to buy it. I don't have to work for it. It's new. I just have to receive it by faith. Don't worry about being holy. Don't worry about self-sacrifice. Don't worry about commitment. You know what they're saying? And it's literally being done in churches. Eat, drink, and be merry. And you know the rest of it. I've never thought I would come into a day where there's so many pastors addicted to alcohol and some of their congregation openly drinking. We were happy that our cupboards are filled with medicines and drugs. And I'm not opposed to getting help until we get our miracle. How many know what I'm talking about? But we can't be satisfied. I think of Rose. She's going through the battle of her life right now. And she is not satisfied. She's still standing in God for a healing. You know, at 80-some years old, she said, well, I've lived my life. I guess I need to give up. That's not Rose. She anoints herself with oil. She stands in the place of God. She said, God, I'm believing for a healing. That's a fighting. That's a warrior spirit. But some of us, something happens to us, go, well, I guess it's all over with. I guess I just need to lay down and die. No, 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 no. Our willingness not to march around the wall for six days just once is taking us captive. Our willingness not to go on the seventh day and march around the wall seven times and blow the horns and shout unto God is causing us to be silenced and captive. There must be a willingness in our heart to fight for our families, to fight for our marriages, to fight for our sons and daughters who are going to devil's hell unless somebody stands in the gap and says, No more, devil. Well, I might make him angry. So be it. He's already angry. Well, he might do something to me. He's already doing something. We cannot be. We cannot be happy with what's happening in America. We cannot be happening at the level of spirituality in our personal lives. We cannot be happy with what's going on in the church and the spirituality and commitment, the fire of God in our churches, including this church. We must declare war on complacency, prayerlessness, powerlessness, apathy we must declare war on the devil and then after proclaiming war not go and join his ranks by doing nothing see you can declare war all you want but if you still don't do anything nothing's changed we can all sit around and sing kumbaya we hate the devil we hate the devil we hate the devil and if we don't change anything, nothing's going to change. You know, the, the Revelation 14 scripture says, put in the sickle. That must, doesn't mean hold it on your side. Everybody pass around and look at it and say, oh, isn't it sharp? And it's, it's to, everybody take that sickle and take it to your house and take it to your street and take it to your work. Put in the sickle. These are the days of the sickle. Are you hearing me today? See, I understand where we're living today. I understand exactly what's going on today. And this is what the Lord has called our church to do, is not only understand it, but do something about it. June 1986, I'm getting ready to close. First service at the Church on Rock, I made this statement. There are not very many. There was just a very small crowd, but I need to tell you, those of you here, what I said. I said, God has sent me here to raise up an army of believers to reach the lost and disciple the found. Some of you wonder about our vision or mission statements when it's all reached the lost and disciple found, but so many other people don't remember the first part, to raise up an army. And as I was in prayer last night, the Lord brought me back to this. This was something I hadn't included in the message, and this is what he, he showed me. He said, you must be reminded that that was the first part. The goal was to raise up an army of dedicated believers unto the Lord. How is that done? That's the second part, reach the lost. And once they're saved and snatched out of hell, disciple them that are found. 
The simple reaching of the lost and discipling the found without a purpose after that happens leaves us nowhere. The, the sole purpose of, of the Christian is to be a part of the Lord's army. That's why he's called the, the Lord of Heaven's armies. There's an army in heaven made up of angels, but you know what? God's designed an army on earth made up of men and women and young people that love God. Today, my focus, and, and I, 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 I don't like change. And I think it's ironic that God spoke to me about changing and making different changes because I don't like it. For 20-some years, I basically stayed without a whole lot of change in everything we did. And then all of a sudden, God just let me know he wasn't happy with me and he wasn't happy with way, where we were headed, that we're not raising up an army. And if that's going to change, we have to change. We have to challenge. We have to tear down. We have to uproot. We have to plant. We have to water. A lot of things have to be done in our lives personally, in our families, in our church, and, and everywhere we go. It's not to say that, that everything we've done doesn't matter. Of course it does. We've seen a lot of people say. We've seen a lot of people help. Some of you have come a long way, but what I'm saying is there's a future. There's a day past today is what I'm saying. There's a day past today for all of us. Today is not the golden ring. Today is just another day headed to glory. We're on our road to glory. So perhaps it will be a big change to know that I am calling this church, our congregation, to a new beginning that embraces the old vision. Raise the army. Fight. Reach the lost and disciple the found. I'm calling those of you at the Church on the Rock to join me in this fight. There is no blame. There is no finger pointing. There is nothing. We have all somewhat, somewhat been trapped by the things of this world and the influences of this world. But now it's time to realize that something new is coming. God is showing up. God is going to release power, and he wants to use me and you. It's not a poor me party. It's not a finger pointing thing. It's just a simple fact that when we're not busy and our eyes on the things of God, then we'll put our eyes on other things and that takes us away from the things of God. And busy is not busyness. Busy is the assignment and busy is what God has called us to be busy in, the assignment. Pastor, I... How do I know I'm on the right path? Well, it's simple. God's influence in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. If you and I are following the right path in our personal lives and our families, which make up the church, then we will have power, love, and a sound mind. Does that mean we always feel powerful? No. Does it mean that we always feel that we're loved or we're giving out love all the time? No, we fight, we, we battle. Does it mean that, that we have a sound mind? No, sometimes we're perplexed and we're confused and we, we, we have to deal with things. We ask God to help us. What do I do with this? What do I do with this? What do I do with this? My family. But that doesn't change the fact that God's influence will always lead us the right way. So what about the other influence? Well, then you have the influence of the enemy. No peace, no joy, confusion, no sound mind, no power. So if I sat and took a look at my life over the last week, 30 days, 60 days, year, I'm wondering what's influencing me the most. Is God's influence really the most? I love God. You love God. We want to serve God. We all love God. But really, when you look at that word product, when the world sees you and I, who do they see it influence us the most? Because what influences us will cause us to make decisions, and the decisions that we make, make us. Amen? Just because we are in a war, and I admit, I have to admit, and I will say this to you, 
I have not geared all my thinking, all my resources on this war. I have not. And I think if we're honest, most of us might say that. Now, God understands. We have families to raise, jobs to go. He understands every bit of that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being led by the Spirit of God in war where the war comes. I'm talking about being led by the Spirit of God and not writing off warring, but allowing myself to be available to war as God brings me to that position. You see what I'm saying? Every day we get on, we're going to be attacked. We get up, we're going to be attacked. So that means I get up with the ability to war and my senses being keen to fight and to discern what's going on around me while I am loving my family, while I am working, while I am doing this or that. That person God brought my way rather than now who cares. See what I'm saying? It's as we live this life out, God interjects that attitude of war. Finally, I want to say this to Christians that are MIA, missing in action. We don't know if the enemy got you. We don't know if you got lost along the way. We pray for you, and we're looking for you. To those that have been prisoner of war, held captive by addiction, depressions, and sin, been made a slave because they didn't realize they were in a war and had been held captive. I say that we give ourselves as this congregation to be as a conduit of God, to release the power of God in our generation so that you can be set free. As a conduit of God. To take personal responsibility to be used as a conduit of God so that this generation will see the power of God. So that you'll be set free. To those that are AWOL, We offer invitation to you to return and join us in the battle. In the battle, no questions asked. Just join back in the battle. And finally, to those that have fought and made the ultimate sacrifice, they've given it all. They have fought the good fight. They have completed the course. They remain faithful and true. This I say. With God's certain help, we will join them shortly. We will be caught up together at the, at the blowing of the trumpet. We'll spend our time in eternity in our heavenly home. But until then, we war. We war for our marriages, our lives, our sons, our daughters, our friends, our grandsons, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. We war because time is short. Amen? Would you bow your heads all over this place? For you that are guests today, I, I just want you to know that, that to me this is a message for the church on the rock, but I believe overall it's a message for the church. We had to find a place and time to dig our heels in the ground and say, Satan, no more. No more. We fight. We fight. We fight. We will take back what the enemy has stolen. We will see the glory of God upon the faces of the people we love and care about and those we don't even know will be set free. Father, we thank you today. I pray that, that the power of the Holy Spirit will take these words and drive them into our heart to the place that we say yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want to fight. I want to be a part of this army. I want to join other people in this church and around the world to fight and push back darkness. 
I want to be a conduit of the Spirit of God. I want to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. I want the demons to tremble and flee when I get around, just like they did when Joshua's army came to Jericho. Their heart melted within them. I want demons to be nowhere around because the power of God is so real and so vibrant, so alive in my life. I want to change because I understand if I don't change, things aren't going to change, so I want more. I want more than I've ever had. I want more intimacy, more love, more power, more mercy, more grace. I want more of the Holy Ghost than I've ever had. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If that's you, listen to me. I mean this sincerely. If that's you and that's your prayer, I want you to stand all over this place. I want you to stand if that's your prayer. What I've said this morning in nowhere, in no way is, is reflecting the fact that you are not warring. It's the fact that we need to continue if we're already started, but if we have not, we need to. It's no reflection on character. It's, it's a reflection of God speaking to our heart this morning. Look at your family. Look at your life. Look at people and say, I need God to move in there. I need God to move in there. So would you lift your hands all over this place? Would you begin to pray right now? Stand in the gap right now. Don't be prayerless, but be prayerful right now. Pray for your family right now. Pray for the things that are heavy on your heart right now. Pray right now. Go ahead. Don't, don't worry about the person around you. Pray right now. Maybe you start with yourself. That's what I had to do. Say, Lord, I don't understand. I don't know, but I know I want more of you. I don't want, I don't want to keep silent. I don't want to keep, I don't want to keep silent. I want, I don't want to be held down. I want, I want more of you, God. I want to walk openly. Amen. Amen. This is not a prayer from people coming that are perfect, but people being perfected. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Pray for our families. Pray for our personal lives. Pray for our sons and daughters. Pray for people we love and care about. We lift them up right now, Lord, and say, move in a mighty way by your Holy Spirit. You know the needs. You know the situations. Please, God, move according to your mercy and your grace and your great power. Thank you, Lord. God, I pray as pastor of this church that we will begin to be unified now to, to fight. That like never before, we battle. We will knock down the walls of the enemy. We will break the chains that hold people back and hold them in bondage. Oppression. Deliverance shall come. Healing shall come. Miracles shall come. Provision shall come. In the mighty name of Jesus. Marriages will be restored in the mighty name of Jesus. Prodigals will come home in the mighty name of Jesus. Our cupboards that are empty because the enemy stolen from us they influence us to make wrong decisions. As we repent even now, God will restore the cupboards with the provision that we need. We will not be threatened into keeping silent, but we will pray. We will cry out to God, knowing that you are our only help, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you strengthen right now, not just marriages, but relationships between daughters and sons and mothers and fathers. I'm praying for those children in the third chair, those, those sons and daughters those in the third chair that have compromised and conflicted themselves. I'm praying God do a supernatural thing. Move them into the chair of commitment. Move them into the chair of commitment and power right now. We come against the addictions in your home. We come, we, come against, we come against the pride that's holding things down, chaining you to the seat. We come against, in the mighty name of Jesus, your despair and, and your depression. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pronounce joy. We pronounce healing. We pronounce the power of God to raise you up. We pray that the chains of, that are on you are broken in the mighty name of Jesus. No more fear. 
No more intimidation. In the mighty, mighty name of the King of Kings. Raise up, raise up, raise up, raise up our children, God. Raise up our children. Let prophets, evangelists, apostles, teachers, oh, God, raise them up. Raise them up, up out of our children, God. Let those stand here today that have a mighty calling be fulfilled, be operating with words from God, with power from God. We have all been called to the Great Commission. Let us not omit that. Hallelujah. For we agree. Does anybody here agree? I said, does anybody here agree? If you don't, you don't. But if you do, you need to say so. Because we're to agree. You know the rest of it. I'm going to say to you, in the next few months, there are going to be miracles released. Today is that beginning for you and for me and for this church. Today, we not only start just a teaching, but we start the war. Too long, it's been brought to your home, we've been taking it to you. Now we're going to take it to him. Are there any warriors in here? I'm asking, are there any warriors in here? Amen. There's a lot of ways to serve in God's army, a lot of ways. But they all go with one purpose, to war. Amen. Father, Thank you for the grace to be able to share this all-important, difficult message. I know this is not the message of popularity. I know this is not the message of blessing, of comfort. But this is the message that will save us. This is the message that will cause us to live fearless lives. Now raise us up. Pray the Holy Spirit begin to speak in the hearts of every man and woman in this place right now and begin to pour out. From the end of your belly comes the rivers of living water. Just begin to pour out from inside that power, that spirit, that glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me say this, that we're going to be eating outside in just a few minutes. We, if you got your stuff, you're going to bring it to the table. But if you're a guest here, I want to especially say this. Please stick around. We'd love to have you join us. And uh, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen.